Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this call all CBUA sponsored webinar. Uh, Melissa Belvati, the collections librarian at the University of Prince Edward Island is going to introduce us to uh, the counter five report tool that was recently uh, developed at the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, just an FYI per our usual practice, the webinar is being recorded uh, and the recording will be posted to the call website uh, probably later this afternoon once I get the recording back. Um, but I will uh, send a message out to everybody alerting them to the fact that the, the um, recording has been posted. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation, so we ask that you hold your questions until the end. Um, so as to minimize background noise during the webinar, I ask that you please mute yourself uh, for the duration of the webinar unless you wish to speak and then you can unmute. Um, you can also ask questions and share thoughts via the chat function. Um, and I will be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar uh, and I will pass on any comments or questions for those who cannot or prefer not to ask them out loud. Um, just a note that closed captioning is uh, available by clicking on if you move to your cursor to the middle of the screen and you see that menu bar that pops up. If you click the three dots, there is an option to turn on live captions. Um, so for those of you who uh, that's actually very helpful for those of you uh, or who also who where English may not be your first language. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier to follow along with what's being said. Um, also on that same menu, uh, for those of you in low bandwidth areas, you can turn off incoming video. Um, that will uh, help with your bandwidth, but uh, I ask that if most folks, uh, if you can please turn off your video for the, for the webinar, just because it helps those with uh, low bandwidth if you do so. Um, before I turn the floor over to Melissa, I'd like to acknowledge that um, the Council of Atlantic University Libraries, Conseil de Bibliothèque Universitaire de l'Atlantique, uh, call CBUA, represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunutsavut and Nunutkavut and the Inu of Nitasinan. Uh, the Beotic and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, in Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Lewistook, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBUA wish to express our sincerest gratitude uh, to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Melissa. Uh, who will present the new tool to us. Melissa. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Welcome to everybody and a special welcome to um, some of the students who actually helped develop this software and to the Project Counter Technical Advisory Group members who have joined us, who, whose presence is intimidating me a little bit. So I'm sure they'll catch me in the Q&A if I say anything slightly wrong about the standards. OK, let's get going. Um, so i got to make sure I hopefully you can see my screen. So some basic, very basic information, but I should say I'm not going to try to explain the basics of Counter 5. I did a, an informal intro to Counter 5 yesterday and the recording's available for anyone who wants to see it. So I'm going to assume that if I talk about master reports, standard views, attributes and metrics that you basically know what I'm talking about. So what is this thing, the Counter 5 report tool? It is a Counter 5 Sushi Harvester report manager and, and data analysis tool. It was made by a team of UPEI's fourth year computer science students doing a special group project with me acting as their client. And uh, um, they did, I think they did a fantastic job. Um, where to get it? It's um, in GitHub right now. And I, all the URLs I show you are also going to be on the very last slide during the Q&A. So don't worry about not having a chance to write that down. This is a desktop program, a desktop app, um, which we have versions for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and uh, it's written entirely in Python, and it's entirely local desktop running. No local servers of any kind are needed at all. The, the main search database that you'll see the functionality of is an SQLite 3 file. Not, there, there isn't even a local server running for that. So that makes it totally portable. Um, there, there isn't even a proper installation routine, like nothing goes into the Windows registry or anything or sets up hidden files in other, you know, other parts of your operating system. It literally just sits entirely in one folder. Um, 
so that makes it very easy to move around to uh, you can literally run multiple instances if you had some reason you wanted to do that in different folders. Um, and finally, this is designed for individual libraries. Uh, Counter does have consortial reports and it does not support those. So I've mentioned the term Sushi for people not familiar with that. Sushi is the um, API protocol. An API protocol is, is a set of rules for computers to talk to other computers um, generally across the internet um, to, to retrieve data usually. Um, and this is the, the particular API protocol to get your counter five data from your vendors. Um, it can't do everything for you. And in particular, the vendors as part of the protocol require you to have some kind of credential information that identifies your specific account. And some of these sometimes behave almost like passwords. Um, so the minimal one is the customer ID, but they can also, they being the vendor, can also sometimes require you to include a requester ID and or an API key. Um, and they can also, they're allowed under the API Sushi standard to um, have other limitations um, such as only accepting connections from say the same campus IP range that your account with them is configured for or something like that. Um, and as, as you'll see in a bit, sometimes they even require different credentials for different platforms within that vendor. So a quick summary of the functionality, um, it manages your vendor data, it the most, obviously the most basic functionality is the report harvesting. It can fetch all of the supported um, counter five or R5 reports, masters and master reports and standard views that are supported by each vendor respectively. Um, it it's designed to make it very quick and simple to harvest the calendar year reports, which is typically the, the counter default. And that becomes important throughout the platform to think of the calendar year as, as a default behavior. Um, and in terms of the current year, mid-year, you know, 2020 right now, it's it treats that as a calendar defo default. And it will, if you want to keep getting the data every single month as it comes in, it will keep overwriting that without your having to do anything special to, to keep updating that. Um, it also gives you functionality to request specific reports for other date ranges besides the calendar default and um, in the case of the master reports um, to, to make more customized granular and, and filtered special one-off reports that might be useful to you. It um, does allow for vendors that support counter five but not the sushi protocol. Um, it has a functionality that you can, if you get the reports from the vendor directly, you can then import them into this so they become part of the system. It we also very recently added the ability to import counter four reports, but because of differences in the metrics between four and five, there, there's only a limited amount of, of metrics that uh, that can be converted to counter five, and it does convert them as it brings them in. Um, it's creating, as I mentioned briefly before, a searchable database that's very powerful on all of the calendar year default report data that you bring in, whether you're doing it by the API Sushi or you're doing it through manual import, all goes into one big searchable database. Um, and it has a basic data visualization feature for ge generating line and bar charts in Excel. And, uh, and then it also has a feature where you can put in your, your vendor costs, whether that be per database or per title um, that can then be incorporated into the data visualization reports. So downloading it is and installing it's re really, really easy. You just get the one that's for your platform and I use Windows, so I'm primarily going to be talking about the Windows one. Um, the one thing is that when you first try to run the Windows one, uh, so you download the zip and the only thing in the zip is the exe. That's it. There's nothing else. There's no install program. The exe is the program. And the very first time you run it, you're going to get this annoying pop up from Microsoft who basically wanted us to pay, I think, a thousand dollars to get registered as a as a known publisher and we had no budget so that wasn't happening so so we tell you really seriously trust us run it anyway this the code is all open source and, and github if you want to take a close look at it to be to feel safe about that and then and now i'm ready to switch over to oh wait a minute actually before i do that i did want to show you here. So this is the GitHub site and um, I'm on the code tab. The wiki tab is the user manual and uh, the, some of the help links inside the program itself will actually link, jump you over to your web browser and open up the wiki. Um, I'm going to mention in a moment uh, some 
vendor lists that, that I've set up ahead of time to make some things a little easier for you. And that's here inside the code section. That's a, a very simple little list of things you can download. So, okay. So with that, here is the actual tool. When you, oh, I want to show you the folder. So here's, I downloaded the zip file. I created a folder, called it whatever I wanted on my desktop. And when I unzip it, here's the exe and that's it. Like I said, there's nothing to run to install it. That's the executable. The very first time you run it, after you get past that blue message, it starts to create the all data tree of, of files that it needs to work, including the searchable database and the vendor table and all the rest of it. Um, it also, when you run, every time you run it, it's going to open up a, a console window, which you can just don't kill it because it'll kill the program, but just minimize it. And I'll talk later about how that might be useful to you. But uh, that's it. And then here's the program. Um, by default, it opens up into fetch reports, but I wanted to start by showing you, um, actually, I'm going to start by showing you settings. I'm going to explain the advanced settings later, but the two I want to point out immediately when you very first get started is the directories, because you typically want to set these right the very first time you use it before you start downloading reports and, and then don't change it again after that, especially um, the, the yearly, the other files you can change as much as you want. The yearly files is where the whole tree of all the default calendar reports go and you want to pretty much choose that and then leave it alone. And I'll talk about the other advanced settings later. Okay, so then the first thing you need to do to get going is you need to put in vendors. Um, so I mentioned we're um, providing a basic fold, uh, file that you can import. You'll notice there's import and export vendor tools down here um, to sort of pre-populate things. Or if you want to put them all in manually yourself with that vendor, you can certainly do that. And this is typically what a vendor record looks like. You've got the, the vendor name, the base URL that you would get, that's information you get from the vendor. And then those credentials I talked about before you'd get from for your particular account from your vendor. Um, the, the platform I'll, I'll mention in a moment. Um, the description and third party boxes are generic open-ended boxes for you to put whatever notes you want in. Um, the click on another one of these. The non-sushi vendor checkbox is for if you do want to import reports manually but don't have any sushi credentials that that will make them visible as choices to select in, in some of the other functions without it trying to fetch reports automatically from them so that's what that is so um, yeah so then you can you can like I said you can um, import a TSV file uh, with all your credentials and, and then edit the whole giant table if you've already collected them somewhere else um, edit it in whatever you like to edit tab separated files in. Just a warning that some customer IDs look numeric but have leading zeros and programs like Excel have a tendency when it looks numeric to strip off the leading zeros and of course that'll make your customer ID invalid. So if you're playing around with editing the TSV in spreadsheet software, be very careful you don't lose your leading zeros on the on and on any of the credentials, but I've noticed it on the customer ID. You can, of course, when you edit anything, you can save the changes, undo them. You can also remove a vendor, but I just want to alert you that that literally just removes them from the vendor table. If you had already imported or, or fetched any kinds of reports, it that will not remove their data from the rest of the system. It just literally removes them from the vendor table. Um, by the way, there's little pop-up help things throughout the system that, uh, that explain specific things. So there's the explanation about what that checkbox is for. And the bigger tab help system is the one that'll open up the uh, your web browser and, and the wiki page with the more detailed explanation of all the functionality. Okay, um, so that's... Uh, yep, I think that's all for the vendors. Um, okay, so the, the big major obvious function, fetch the reports. So um, the box at the top is the simplest, most obvious, just do everything for me. So for a given calendar year, and like I said, if you're mid calendar year, like 2020, it, it, it will be up to the previous month. So if I run it now in May, it'll give me January through April, because that's the way the counter standard works is vendors won't give you part of a month. They only give you a complete last month. Um, that will for every vendor that's not a non-sushi vendor, that's, and you can see all the ones that I have, that I have sushi credentials in here. For Basically for all of these vendors, this will just fetch them all without my fussing with any of the rest of these settings. It just does them all. But if I want to pick and choose specific ones, I can select 
whichever vendors I want, one or more at a time. I can select whatever reports I want, one or more at a time. And I can either accept the default date range or change it to whatever I want. If I, for instance, change it to, say, our fiscal year, which might be one situation in which you want to do this. Um, our fiscal year is actually May to April, but I know a lot of you are... are Anyway, um, the moment I changed that off the, the default calendar year range, it popped open this that warns you this isn't a calendar year date. And there's a note at the bottom, only data that's a perfect calendar year, including the current partial one, the year to date one, will get saved in the search database. The moment I change this to being non-standard, um, the report is going to be generated just for me. It's not going to go anywhere else in the system. Um, and it gives me the dialogue on where to save it to. So I'm going to just do a quick one here. I'm going to do a Brill fiscal year TRJ1 and fetch selected. Oops, <laughs> what did I do wrong? Yes, that's supposed to be 2020 April. Yeah, see the system even warned me. My dates didn't make sense. And it's going to go out, and this is literally live going and hitting the server. You saw that one. I deliberately chose a vendor that's nice and quick. <laughs> Brill's pretty quick, and it's only one report. I expand the search results, and it, if I had multiple reports and some of the ones I had selected were not supported by that particular vendor, it would have told me here and not even tried to get them. So um, it's giving me two options on what to do next, or three, including closing it. If I click on this, it will just immediately, that's the TSV file itself, it will immediately open it in whatever program, desktop program I have set as my default for TSV files, which for me is LibreOffice, because it opens faster than Excel, and there's literally my report. Okay, so I'm going to close that. Um, the folder is also another useful tool. If you don't necessarily want to open this right away, but you want to get to it to do something with it, clicking on that immediately takes you to the folder where that file was just saved, so that um, you can then, you know, copy it up to Google Sheets or whatever else it is that you want to do with it. So sometimes you just want to get to the folder without opening the file. Um, sometimes the requests will fail, and there's, there's essentially two different ways it can fail. It can fail in a way that, um, among many, many er error codes, that there's no point in trying again. There's something really big broken. Um, and sometimes it will fail in a way that it gives a warning um, like Elsevier does, where Elsevier requires you to run every single report twice. The first time it gives you an error saying that it's queued up, and then the second time it says, it, and then it says, wait a few minutes and try again, and then the second time it gives you the data. So when that happens, you'll get checkboxes over here for the ones that are worth retrying, and that's what the retry I selected is for. And um, I can show you really fast what, like for instance, I mentioned um, before Elsevier is one that does IP checking and I of course am at home. And so Elsevier gives me an annoying error message, <laughs> basically that um, I happen to know comes down to, that's a, a underlying HTTP error that comes down to the fact that they're not going to let me in as long as I'm off campus. So that's an example of an error that fails that there's no point in retrying, so there's no retry checkbox. Okay, um, so there's one important note that I need to mention. I talked about how it's putting the data into the search database for the calendar year reports. The one place in, in this entire application where we vary from the official rules of Project Counter is fetching the master reports. And that's because the master reports by default aggregate a lot of really useful granular attribute and metric data into single subtotals. And I thought when we were going through this that for the search purposes, we really want that data all broken out. It gives you much more powerful control for, for generating your searches. Um, so what it does when you for, for all of the master reports, DR, IR, PR, and TR, is it, it actually pulls it twice. It pulls the, the fully granulated data to stick into the search database, and then the official default version that, that is what it's going to give you in the TSV file for you to use. So you've got the data both ways in a sense to use. Um, and that only applies to the master reports because the standard views, of course, are, are, are canned reports with all of those filters and attributes predefined. That's the whole point of a standard view. So, okay. Um, so, okay, uh, special reports. Um, so I 
I've mentioned this a couple of times, but for the master reports, there are all of these granular options, not just to display, but also to filter, and which options are available depend on which report type you're, you're actually looking at. And so we wanted to give you the ability to make your own custom subsets of the master data. So for instance, let me see, I'm going to do, show you the pieces of it. I'm going to pick Sage journals and Taylor and Francis journals. By the way, if you notice really fast, like I have Taylor and Francis journals and books and Oxford books and journals, that's an example of a single vendor that has completely different uh, sushi credential sets for their two different platforms. That's why they're listed like that. Um, so I'm going to do Sage and Taylor and Francis journals. I'm going to do a TR. I want to filter my data type to just journals, which is probably kind of obvious for Taylor and Francis at least. And I want to filter my access type. Access type is controlled means you have to have the subscription or, you know, paid access. But I'm saying, I, I'm thinking, I want to know for Sage and Taylor and Francis, what, what kind of usage are we seeing on their open access content? And um, so that access type. And of all the metrics, the only one I, I usually care about for journals is the unique item request. So I just, and you, you can see you could choose multiple ones. If you choose multiple ones of any of these things, you, you're going to end up with multiple lines per title in your usage report. So if you choose only one of each, you'll get nice one line per title. Okay, and I'll just go ahead and let that run for the, the current, uh, time period. It's giving me a chance to change where it's going to save it to. It's going to create the file name. So fetch special report. And this is what it looks like when you have more than one vendor selected is it, it shows you the status on each of them separately. And one may very well finish before the other does. And you can actually even start to expand and deal with like Sage is already done. Oh, I could have started working on this while Taylor and Francis was still running. So this part is just like you saw before. Um, and uh, and that's and basically like if I open up one of these, you will see for office, you'll see that um, it actually lists what my choices were up at the top of according to the rules for the headers. And you'll see that all of my data is for the access type OA gold metric type unique item request data type journal. So again, you're welcome to do as many different custom special reports as you find useful. One caveat for both the other fetch reports and this is that a lot, not all, but a lot of sushi vendors will not support a date range longer than 12 consecutive months. That, that's by the standard, that's all they're required to support. Some will support more than 12 months, but, but a lot won't. And you will, if you try to go too far with that, you'll get a warning message in that, that results box um, that'll say that, uh, you know, that you, it'll give you part, I think it'll give you part of the data, but it'll warn you, you didn't get all of the data you requested because your date range was too long. Okay, so the next place I'm going to jump to for a moment is the search. So you do, you're fetching all of those. So oh, none of, nothing in special reports goes into the search database. Only the default calendar year ranges from fetch reports and the things you do with import report, which I'll get to later, go into the search database. So let's take a look at the search functionality. Um, first of all, you should always choose the report type first because it's going, whatever you choose here is going to then change the options that are in the, the field boxes below. I, I hope librarians are going to appreciate this is a full Boolean search query capability um, because it's, it's using the logic of the SQL table that's underneath. These are all the fields in the TRJ1. These are all your operators. You can even do truncation. It uses, because this is SQL, it uses percent sign instead of wildcard. And unfortunately, you can't do multiple keyword um, within a single box. You could say this word or this word or this word or this word and this word and this word, but, but, you, um, but otherwise it's doing exact phrase searching. And however, it is not case sensitive. So you don't need to worry about capitalizing whatever string you're searching against here. Um, you can export your query for later use and I'm going to take and then import it. So I'm going to take advantage of that right now rather than put in an entire search. Why is this sudden? Oh, it's just my operating system decided to slow down a little bit. 
That's why I have my webinar files. So I'm going to show you an example of, see, it just populated everything for me, starting at the top, the report, the date range. And so I'm doing a, a search on the, the TRJ1, um, where the title has something to do with Canada or something to do with Toronto. And it's looking only going to give me back the unique item request metric. And I only want the titles for whom the reporting period total is three or greater. That's an I'm just showing off the features of it. You then get to choose what you want it to do at the end of running. Do you want it directly to open up the result file, which is going to be a TSV file? So again, whatever your default TSV program is, for me, that'll be LibreOffice. Or you want it to open up the, fol the containing folder that the report is in or both. I'm just going to open up the file for now because you've already seen how that other thing works. It's giving you a chance to... Um, to say, tell what file name you want and what folder you want this in. So I'm just going to call it TST, that's fine. And give it a chance to run. It's pretty quick, unless my computer's bogging down for some reason. Um, and there we go. And I'm opening up in LibreOffice. And again, it's just a simple TSV file. It doesn't have a header because it's not a counter report. It's just a query on the database. And there's... Um, you could see it was cross-platform, cross cross-vendor. There's all my unique item requests is what I requested. Um, it even tells you the file name of where the data is stored. If you did want to go back and say, wait a minute, which report did that come from? Um, you can see exactly the, uh, the names and there's your, your actual usage data. So whatever it is you want to do with that. Um, just to show you an, another slightly different one, um, the master reports, um, let me go ahead and run that. Um, I'll call it. Um, I described before about how for this purpose of the search, we pull in the full granular attribute and metric data and filter data for the master reports. So one consequence of that, and that includes the YOP, the year of publication. So one consequence of that for this is that you are going to get multiple lines per title broken down by the YOP. So if you're doing, and this only applies again to the master reports. So if you're doing a search query on a master report, be prepared to probably do some pivot table work on the outcome. If the YOP data breakdown is not what you really wanted, you're going to want to collapse those. So that one's just taking a little bit longer, but I'm sure it'll be finished in just a moment. And here we go. And you can see I've got lots of multiple lines per title, and that's because of it being broken down by the YOP. Okay. Okay, and then finally, I want to show you one more really quick one, which is what a database, because those were both title. This would be a DRD1 database report, and I'm going to just pull up all uh, the regular searches from EBSCO from 2018 to 2020. And it doesn't matter what I call it. And save. And now you can see, and um, in this case, um, I've got the three lines because I was doing three years. So there's 2018, 2019, and 2020 data. Um, EBSCO being one of the few vendors that, that has converted fully over to Counter 5 all the way back to January of 2018. Okay, so that's the search functionality. So it's pretty powerful. For those of you who are real SQL nerds, because the the underlying search database is a single SQLite file, if you find this not even powerful enough for you, you could actually point a, a free SQL tool like dBeaver or SQLite Studio directly at the search.db file and, and actually do your own queries and things on, on it directly. Um, so that's also a... a, a a high advanced functionality that's available as part of the way this system was designed. So, okay, I'm going to jump now over to costs because these two things together are going to explain the next one. So you can put in the system um, for any master report type um, for any platform database or title, basically your per year cost. And so I'm going to show you, for example, database report, Jump, I'll just hit the letter E to jump down to the E's to get EBSCO and 2019. And as you look through, the, this is all of the 
um, databases that my prior retrieving of data for EBSCO has told the system to know about. And that's, a, by the way, an important point is you can't start putting in cost data unless you've already retrieved a report that includes some actual usage data for that whatever it is with 2019 database or whatever um, because otherwise it wouldn't have anything to populate this list with. Now you notice the academic search complete is bolded. That's the system's way of indicating at a quick glance which ones I've already put cost data into and which ones I haven't. So if I click on that one you see I already have my, my test cost data in here for as a sample. Um, this is all saved um, per report type as TSV files and you can very easily easily um, copy those and then import them. If you're tempted to try, so you say, oh, it's just a TSV file sitting there, I'll just edit it directly. That won't work because it needs to actually get ingested into the search database, not just simply stuck in the folder tree. So um, especially for the next thing I'm going to show you, which is how this can be useful. Um, you do need to fill in all of these, even if your original currency is the same thing as your local currency. Um, and, and you, of course, want to hit save when you change them. The refresh is if you started to change something and then realize, oh, wait a minute, no, this isn't the one I have, and you haven't hit save yet, refresh will pull it back to what it was in the database. But once you hit save, that's gone. There's no log files or audit files or anything. So don't hit save unless you're sure you got it all right. Okay, um, so that's that's the basics for putting cost information. And again, you can you can put in database level prices. You can put in title level prices if it's a journal publisher that you buy lots of individual titles with. All of that, and that will feed into then the functionality in the data visualization tool. So this has somewhat more limited search, but it also has two nice aggregating functions. So again, you always want to start by choosing the report type because that's going to change things that happen down below. And you, you want to basically go down the form because when you change the calculation type, that'll also change options down below. So um, this will, by definition, because it's going to create a graph for you, a, char a bar, or chart or line chart, it's going to create an Excel file, not a TSV. You can't put that stuff in a TSV. So it'll always be an Excel file. So for example, I'm going to do a DR 2018 to basically the same thing I just showed you the EBSCO uh, database search on. Um, I want it to be a vertical bar. I want yearly. I'm not going to bother filling these in. You can always edit this stuff later in Excel. I want EBSCO. And um, here you have to, you can only do this one database at a time. So I want academic search complete. And I love my unique item requests. Um, and again, it's default. What does it do when it's finished creating it? I want it to open it right away. And I need to give it a, I'm going to call that test V. See how fast that was. Excel will take a moment to open up. And there it is. Of course, the 2020 is missing a lot of data because we're only partway through the year, but it actually shows you the data in a chart as uh, um, in a table as well as a chart. Um, and then from here, this is you're straight in Excel. So whatever you want to do to to modify this, you know, change the chart type, the colors, everything else is is just totally Excel now at this point. OK, um, the the two aggregating functions. Um, are the top number and cost ratio. So cost ratio, so I'm going to leave um, all of this the same, except oh, except I'm just going to do 2019. Make this a little more obvious. Oops, 2019. And so I'm going to do a cost ratio. I get to choose which of those cost numbers I put in the cost table. So I want it in original currency. It's going... Um, and I have to choose the rest of this and the cost ratio on what metric on searches on investigations, whatever. Um, and done wait for Excel to open. And I only have the one bar because <laughs> um, I think I maybe only have that that cost ratio data. And these are doing the usual weird thing where it's got too big a number for the column, but the data is really in there. And the top number is um, if you want it for a given, like for a given uh, day, uh, type of report for a given vendor, say I want to know, so I'm going to switch to a TRJ1. This will be a bit more meaningful. For 2019, um, I like horizontal bars for titles. I want the top 15 
titles and usage for EBSCO for whatever metric I want, which is going to be my unique item requests again. And there I can see what were the top and I could have picked any number. Now, realistically, if you pick a really big number, you're going to have a miserable chart, <laughs> but you might want to see the top 50. And because it's giving you the data calculated for you over here, maybe you just throw away the chart and you use the rest of the spreadsheet that can be handy just for that sort of side functionality. Um, and uh, I think that's yeah, that's the oh, I just wanted to show you really fast a monthly line chart. Now I have to choose the you can only do one database at a time. So, oh, I'm still in a T. I don't want a T. I want to, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'll do it. I'm going back to DR. DR for 2019 monthly on, I'll go back to academic search complete. And again, what metric I want, just unique item requests. And so there you have your nice little, and if I'd chosen two years, I'd have two lines and two columns, one for 2019, one for 2018, or whatever it is you choose that you've got data for. So you can see if you like your monthly charts, it'll do that too. Okay, so that's the visualization feature. Um, so then a couple of the other more advanced features that I've got left to show you are the um, import report. So this is this is going to show you all of your vendors, not just the sushi ones. Um, and you do, if you if you have someone that you got, you need to import reports for um, that you hadn't already put in manage vendors, you need to add them in manage vendors first, and then they'll immediately appear in here. So this is for say a vendor that's not sushi compliant, but you have the counter five reports that you can get manually from them. Very important. These must be calendar year or calendar year to date in the case of 2020. Make sure you set that over here correctly because it is going to ingest, it is going to assume this is calendar year data. Is it, it is going to ingest it into your search database. And if it's not calendar year data, it's probably going to mess up your search data. Um, and for the purposes of the search and the visual and everything. So you do want to make sure that what you're bringing in here is a proper calendar year report. Pick the report type. You, I'm not even going to bother demoing this. It's so obvious. You select the file. It opens up the dialog from for your operating system to go find the file. You import it. And, and if there was something wrong with it, it gives you a failure message. If the, if the file wasn't properly counter compliant, uh, these have to be TSVs, by the way, which is part of the official counter standard. Every vendor should be providing for, for manual, what's called tabular download, should be providing TSV. There are a couple that aren't, but that they're technically required to, to be compliant. Um, and then it, if it, if assuming it was, it'll say successful and that's that the data is now in the search database. Um, if you have the counter four reports, I want, um, I strongly encourage you to go to the help system and read the documentation about what heuristic we're using to convert counter four to counter five, because that's what it's going to do to put the data into the search tables. Um, and uh, you may disagree with what heuristics we chose. We tried to follow Project Counter's official transition advice on, on how to, to make equivalencies, because nothing's perfectly equivalent in these, um, in terms of what the metrics are, but we thought that enough of them were close enough to be useful, um, particularly when you want to do some of this visualization stuff with the cost ratios and all the rest. Now, another important thing to understand is that the various Counter 4 report types will generate a master report and a standard view that corresponds to what that kind of data was meant to be. Um, but because every single time you run it, it regenerates those reports. If you have two or more reports that feed into the same standard view or feed into the same master report, you have to do them all at once. So BR1 and BR2 both create the TRB1 as well as the TR master report. So if you have no journals and you only have those two, you do you choose this one. It will allow you to select multiple files at the same time in your operating system dialog. If you have all of these, that that's running off the edge, but uh, no, actually it's not, that's right. Um, there is no JR3. Um, so all five of these or four of the five of these you would, that all collectively feed into the TR master report. This one will create the TRB1, the TRB2, the TRJ1, the uh, 
TRJ2 and the TR Master Report. And it's okay to use this if you're missing one of these. Um, the system will not throw an error at you. It'll handle it properly because many, many vendors have either a BR1 or a BR2, but not both. And so we were prepared for the fact that you may be selecting four of these five and it, it will we don't have to indicate which for it, it figures it out from the files you give it and uh, and will do the right thing. So that's how to import both counter five and counter four reports. Um, and again, very important, it is gonna put all of that into your search database. So I've gone through all the tabs, except I do wanna go back to settings um, to explain some of the more advanced features. So the, right up at the top is the debug messages and console window. So you remember at the very beginning, I said you get this, this black window, which you can mostly minimize and ignore. Um, the main use I have found for this is that if you're having a problem with a vendor that's not obviously a typo in their URL or, or customer ID or something like that, to the point where you really need to interact with either Project Counter or the, the vendor's customer support to say, hey, something's wrong with your sushi server. You can find the exact URL, where is it? I think it goes to there, um, uh, that, that our software sent to them. You could even copy and paste this into a web, web browser to actually manually rerun it for yourself to even see the error. The, it comes back with horrible JSON, so it's kind of miserable. But And then you can even share this URL with whoever you're troubleshooting with to say, this is exactly what we're doing, and this is... and this is the error message, help us figure out what's what's going wrong here. So that's the main reason this can be useful. And you can turn this on and off, make sure you save changes, um, and then go and run another report. However, if you change anything in here while fetch reports is in the middle of running, which you can actually do, you can come over here and do any of these other things while a big fetch reports is running, but it won't pick up these settings until that one finishes and you run a new one. Um, the rest of these options up here are very internal technical things that have to do with the way the uh, software is, is interacting with those sushi servers. Um, they, there's a lot of idiosyncratic behavior among different, some servers don't want you to hit them for multiple requests within just one second. They want three second interval between, um, I think either JSTOR or Oxford might be one of those. Um, the, the timeout and it's like when to give up when the server's just not gonna respond at all. Um, these have to do with the performance on your own computer and how many it's trying to do at once. And long, I, I, I document all of these and the user agents uh, there's a, just a couple of servers that are kind of quirky about that. Um, so you might have to come in here for a particular vendor, change the settings, go back, fetch the reports for that vendor, and then change them back again for everybody else. So we, we didn't want you to have to go into the Python code to do this. Um, and these are the only ones I've ever found to be a problem with any vendors we work with. Most of the time you won't touch these. Um, the cost one is just the default cost for the cost tab. So there was just the one other setting we had to stick somewhere and, um, and make sure you save your changes. And then down below here, if something goes wrong with your search.db, your SQLite search database, like for instance, you realize you imported some bad reports and there's no, unless you're really fancy with SQL, there's no easy way to get those out. You could go in, take them out of the stored data files that are, I can show you that if, you, if anybody's interested, and um, so that they don't get re-ingested and then completely rebuild the entire search database from all the saved files to, to fix problems. So that again is sort of a troubleshooting type tool there. Okay, and that, let me come back to my slides here. And that was it for everything I wanted to show you. I think I've managed to leave enough time for questions. And uh, want to go ahead. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Uh, it's Cynthia. Uh, yep. There were three questions in the chat while you were uh, speaking. Uh, the first okay. two were related to when you were discussing visualization feature. Um, so for Evelyn Bruno, it asked uh, for cost. How do you handle cost per use if, if subscription is not a calendar year? Uh, um, we don't handle that. Sorry. Um, you may have to kind of, yeah, that, that, th those features were, were designed to be just sort of the simple, obvious default. Um, you can do your own use, use the more advanced search functionality rather than the visual to, to pull up whatever date range you, um, 
data you want in the uh, search and then manipulate it directly in Excel to do your own cost ratio calculations if you need to do something off calendar year. So, um, yeah, sorry about that, but that's as far as we were able to get on that because that would have been much too complicated to try to implement at least 1.0. <laughs> um, so the second question, thank you, uh, Melissa, is mm -hmm. Uh, from Julie Morris at UMB. Uh, it, is it possible to manually enter a new database or title, or do the options in the drop down map back to data on the counter reports? So everything maps back to, all the drop downs are mapping back to data that you've previously ingested. Um, so to manually enter a new database or title, you, you, you can't really. And you could you could by faking it by you know t take an, take a like a counter four or counter five report from that I assume you already have something for that vendor um, and maybe make your own fake mock-up one just to stick it in there and then import that that's a way you could kind of force something to be in but we didn't create a nice easy way to do that um, third question uh, and I think this was during the import report uh, screen you were showing from mm -hmm. Linda Rolston at UMB, are you able to delete an e-resource from the list that has been canceled or if you made an error and want to start over, i.e. rename it, etc.? Are you able to, to delete an e-resource from the list that has been canceled? Well, even if something's been canceled, your past usage data is what it is. Um, so, I mean, if it got ingested, it means you at some point used it. So we hadn't really created any way to, to delete things like that. Uh, again, about if you had a lot of that, um, you again, you could get sophisticated with deleting it straight out of the SQL uh, database. Otherwise, um, delete it from the reports that have been saved. And maybe this is a point where I should just, since people are wanting to, to kind of do things that are not standard. Um, so I mentioned that the moment you run it for the first time, it creates this tree of all data files. And this is where it's saving like the inside vendor managers, the vendor table, the search databases under search. The, the yearly files is where you see the TSVs you've downloaded. Do not modify is saving both in JSON and TSV um, the, the TSV files that would be used by re, for that rebuild the database functionality. So worse comes to worse, you could actually come into the do not modify tree and manually manipulate whatever you need to manipulate in here. Be very careful not to make the file non-counter compliant because then it won't re-ingest properly. Um, but if you did need to pull out a particular thing from a particular vendor, you could come edit the appropriate files here and then use that under settings, use that rebuild the database. That would be about the only way I can think of to do things like that. And let me Thank come you. back to them. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have any questions for uh, Melissa or comments? Um, I think there's some stuff going in the chat here. Uh, Julie had another question. Um, and Julie, if you want to ask uh, directly, you can do so. Otherwise, I'll just read it here. Uh, I understand this is a desktop app. Once I set up the vendors using Quester ID, et cetera, to harvest the data in my interface, is there a way to share with that with my colleagues uh, or would they have to manually set up the vendors as well? Ah, uh, and that is one of the reasons that we added the export and import vendors tab. Uh, functionality. So you set it all up, you export it, you create a, a T here. Yeah, well, let me just do it. Export vendors, blah, blah, blah. Oops, sorry. That's right. That's not the, that's folder name, not file name. So let me just, let me just stick it in the, this folder. That's right. Cause it has its own default file name. Sorry. Um, and so now it's created an exported vendor data.tsv. It tells me again where it is. I can just go take that TSV file, give it to one of my colleagues and they just take that file and they go import vendors and they go find wherever they just stuck that file and, and import it. And they're done. They're set up with everything in all of this that you put in. Thank you, Melissa. Um, another question, apologies if I missed it, but how are you handling restated data? For example, you'd need to know the vendor has restated data and simply run a new report. Right. 
Yeah, that's a problem. Every I think we've all seen that uh, vendors will occasionally say, oops, we discovered something's wrong with the way we were sending our data out. And we encourage everybody to rerun their reports from January to April or something like that. It's incredibly easy. Fetch reports for whichever thing it is you need to redo. You know, for that particular vendor, you could select all their reports, or if they say it's just the TR data, you just do all the TR reports for whatever time range. Um, and and it will go and it will re-retrieve the data for that vendor um, as it is live right now. And as, as long as you've got it set to the calendar year or calendar year to date, it will overwrite, replace all the data in the search database that corresponds to that. So it's that easy to uh, to refresh when the, when the vendors have to send you corrected data. Obviously for the custom reports, that's not going to solve that. You'll have to rerun the, 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 the special reports or any other custom date range reports because that's not part of the search database. Thank you, Melissa. OK, um, does anybody I know, Julie, I think you were wondering to ask a question. You can unmute. Maybe not. Uh, yeah. I'm seeing Megan is sort of saying this was my question as well, but ju just to add further clarification on that, this is this is totally designed, and I come back to the folder system. Like I said, um, this is so completely designed to be portable that except for the exe itself, if you're trying, if you're a Windows user and the other person's a Mac user, they obviously need the Mac version. But the entire all data tree can be simply zipped and given to someone else, and immediately will be. Everything will be that the search database, the vendor table, the the say the cost uh, spreadsheet files, everything in that entire is is in that tree can just be simply copied from one installation to another uh, across computers. Uh, there's and a question from Sue. Uh, we subscribe to Jusp. I'm curious if your tool offers additional functionality. Well, we don't subscribe to just so I can't do a, a function by function comparison. When I did look at it briefly before, I thought that just was first of all not supporting all of the reports, all of the report types, only some of them. It had nowhere near the granularity of control for the search functionality. It certainly, I think, does much more sophisticated um, cost and um, multi-year across vendor analysis than, than, than we have in our visualization functionality. Um, these things are always a trade-off. I think all software is a trade-off between power and, and user friendliness. And we tended to err on the side of power. Um, whereas I think commercial services, even nonprofit commercial services like JUSP, tend to keep things a little simpler, a little more. We assume we know what you want, and here's here's everything we think you could possibly want all ready for you to click, click, and go. So we give you more control, but at the expense you have to do a little more of your own pivoting or whatever to to use the data. I think that's probably the best I can do without being a JUSP customer. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, Melissa. A few more questions. Our Shannon at UNB, uh, does this need to be saved on the C drive or is installation on an external drive possible as well? It should work on anything. I, I think the search functionality might be kind of slow if you're going across a USB one or two <laughs> line to get to where the data is. But um, but like I said, this 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 whole all data folder tree is just completely totally totally portable. So I mean, you could you um, the the tool expects to find the all data folder tree immediately in the same folder it's in, but you could stick like if you have networked drives, uh, and, you know, and you wanted to stick it on the the shared G drive or something like that, that should work just fine. I, I haven't been able to test it, but understanding the way the code works. Um, it should, you know, as long as you keep the executable and the all data tree in the same place, it should work anywhere. Thanks. Um, Allison Pitcher asked, uh, you probably already said, but does the tool automatically harvest calendar year reports or does someone have to run their harvest each year? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's nothing about this that, you know, just somehow, you know, knows to do things without you. But we did make it like ridiculously easy. You have to open up the app. You come here, you pick which year you want. If I, if, 
we'd be waiting a long time if I did this right now. But if I literally say for all of 2019, fetch all reports, that's it. And then I, I walk away or minimize it and, and let it run for the next hour. And it's going to get every single supported report for every single vendor I've got in here. So it, it, it's not literally there's no, because there's no server, right? So I, we don't have a, you know, a, a Linux server somewhere with a, with a cron tab automatically running overnight or something because it's it's entirely desktop so it's going to do what exactly what you tell it to do when you tell it to do it but we did try to make it extremely easy to do the giant batch in just a couple clicks uh thank you um, mandy has a question can we place the all data on a shared drive and then everyone who needs it can install the console on their local machine and then point to the data on the shared drive um, so, like I said, the all data has to be in the same actual folder tree as the executable, but you could put the executable in the shared drive in the same place as the all data and people could run it from there. There'd be no reason. And and, and the so the executable is going to run on your local machine, even though the file, the exe file is literally sitting on the G drive or whatever. Um, so and you could have. You know, you could if you have a mixed environment of like Windows and Mac people, you could have both of those appropriate executables sitting in the same folder. And as long as people know which one to click on for their operating system, that would work. I hope that answered the question. So, so in a way, basically, you can make this server set up if you put it all onto, let's say, a shared server drive, and the executable was there and the all data file was there. Anybody who has access to that folder can can see that all data file. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who has access to the entire to the folder that includes the executable and the all data can see everything underneath. If you're going to do that in a big shared environment, you want to make sure everybody's in it. It's kind of a you know professional trust relationship, not a tightly controlled kind of password. You may notice there's no passwords on any of this at all. So you got to trust that everybody who has access to that folder is not going to screw around with the 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 search DB or the do not modify folder tree because they'll mess everything up for everybody else. But uh, but yeah, so I, I think I anticipated as as everybody's going to want to play with their own custom reports, special reports or whatever, that you'd maybe find a way, you know, depending on your individual workflow to basically share the vendor dot. Um, TSV file, you know, import, export it, whatever, create an internal workflow. And one person is probably the person who keeps the latest data of that, your, your ERM person or whatever. And they, every time they update it, they just send everybody a new TSV and everybody just copy it into the vendor folder. It's literally, you know, or actually you don't copy it into the vendor folder, you just import it. Um, and, and that would probably be the easiest way to give lots of different people access to be able to use all of these querying and visualization tools without them stomping on everybody else. Uh, one last question here from Athena. She was asking, uh, you can change uh, settings where the .tsv file save, right? You can say, set it to a shared folder where many people have access to them? Ah, yes. Um, that's true. I, I was thinking mostly of the settings files, like the vendor file in the search database. But yes, you. I have not, because I just don't have that environment available to me, so I have not tested literally making either of these two settings be, you know, a G drive or whatever. Um, but uh, but I, I can't think of any reason why that wouldn't work, because all the software is looking at these settings, and as long as you have read-write permission there, um, you should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so we have a uh, one minute left. I'm just wondering if anybody has any last minute questions, comments. Uh, uh, you could ask them to chat or unmute and ask them verbally. And like I said, uh, all of the slides and uh, the recording will be uploaded to the call website uh, probably this afternoon. And I will uh, notify everybody who uh, was uh, who signed up for the signed up for the webinar that uh, when it is available. But any last questions? Oh, you're very welcome, Mandy. I do want to just one more time throw up on the shared screen my super thank you to the student developers. Here are their names. Um, but I, I, having said that, I would say. Um, 
probably you shouldn't contact them because they were students who are now, if I think as of last week, officially graduated. This was a fourth year capstone class. And I'm sure they all want to move on to the rest of their lives um, uh, and uh, you know, put this behind them because it was just a class project for them. That said, if anyone loves this so much and you're looking to hire someone, <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I am very happy to give every single one of these individuals a glowing reference for, for employment and, and you know, put you in touch with who did what aspect of the project or whatever. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Just one last question. Allison Pitcher asked, can you can store multiple years of cost data, correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, that's part of the, so see, for a given data type, a given vendor, you can pick what year you're about to put the cost data in. So actually, you can see for Academic Search Complete, I put in 2018 data and, oops, now I just clicked on the wrong thing. Might take a moment. And then I was going to switch back to 2019 and show you that the numbers are different for 2019 data for the same, for the same database, same vendor. So yes, you can put in as many years as you, as you want. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, well, thank you very much, Melissa. This has been very informative and uh, it's great to see this such a powerful tool be available open source to anybody. It, it's such a great representation of the, the ideals that and the and the, what we what we try to we're basically walking the walk of making making these tools useful to, and available to everybody uh, well, you, and not you, hidden behind some payment yeah <laughs> some well, vendor UP, payment you, wall you, you, my institution UPI does have what I think is an international reputation for for participating in the the open source community and I'm very happy to our little project is part of that tradition I do want to say since you mentioned that if anyone's interested in doing any further development on this please contact me um, or even aside from the Python code itself if you even wanted to help me um, enhance the the template vendor list that I have kind of set up for as a starter for people. Um, I basically took everything we had and then I, I used JUSP has their uh, has some public lists of what they think are the counter five sushi non sushi and counter four um, sites. And so I threw that in too. Um, but uh, but I don't know. I haven't I couldn't check any of their data that aren't vendors that we do business with. So any any fixing any wrong data there, adding some that are missing, I would very much appreciate wanting to be able to make that as useful as possible. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you all, all for joining us today. And uh, keep an eye on the call webinar website. And uh, not only will the recordings be posted, but we have uh, other webinars in the upcoming months uh, that you might want to join as well. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Goodbye. It was definitely my pleasure. Bye.